Hello and welcome back to Between the Hashes, everyone, our weekly college football primer. And today on Empire Media, we have a lot to get to, from giant upset losses to blown leads to what may have been the best game of the year, all looking forward to what is, for the third straight week in a row, a matchup between undefeated top 10 teams with Ohio State versus Penn State, our headliner game of the week. Now, but before we get into all that, remember to like, comment, subscribe for more great content on college football or on the Washington Commanders with the John Kime Report. And I think the most resounding impression I have is that regardless of the winner of the game between Washington and Oregon, both teams are playoff caliber. That is the that was the biggest takeaway. Both teams played fantastic. Washington made a few more plays, and honestly, if that game wasn't in Seattle, who know who knows which way it goes. If if the game was in Autzen or on a neutral site or something, like those two teams are so dead even. And I think we're at the point in the season where those two have separated themselves from the rest of the pack, as far as the rest of the Pac-12 is concerned. We've been kind of ballyhooing this that conference as the giant as like the conference to beat this year. Let's say to USC against Notre Dame, most of those teams, including down the down the roster teams that people didn't expect a whole lot of, like Colorado, for example, did really well in the non-conference, and then we're kind of at the point where they're all starting to cannibalize each other. Oregon State was undefeated. They're the next highest Pac-12 team. They were undefeated until they played Washington State. Utah still hanging around, despite the fact that Utah is a very limited ceiling because of all their injuries. They've already re ruined a couple of seasons. Washington State was looking really good, and then they got blown out by Arizona. That said, I don't think that fate is in store for either of the teams we saw this past weekend. I think they'll be playing each other in the Pac-12 title game. Remember, they did a wave with divisions. So I, I really think that we'll be seeing these two teams again this December. Now, as for some of the other Pac-12 teams, one of the more notable results outside of Arizona coming back to life. And in retrospect, their loss to Mississippi State is looking like one of the more baffling upsets all year, just because of how bad one team has looked and how good the other has looked. Colorado went up 29-0 against Stanford on Friday night and then blew that lead and lost in double overtime. I don't have the time to get into dissecting that loss, but I think one of the more notable things is that Travis Hunter played somewhere in the neighborhood of about 150 snaps after coming off of injury, a pretty serious internal organ injury. I really do have to question the wisdom of throwing him out there that much coming off of that kind of an injury. I think after those first couple wins, a lot of us expected Colorado to make a bowl game. While that should still be on the table for them, they're, they're going to be in for a dogfight every single week because that schedule for them only gets harder. But I think the other reason that Oregon and Washington have separated themselves is that I, I, I've been anti-USC all year. So if you've been following this show even a little bit, you'll know this by this point. But they have very firmly established themselves as being not even remotely in the tier of the playoff teams. And I, I said this from day one, but I wasn't expecting their first loss, which was at the hands of Notre Dame, a game I picked. The reason why I picked that game is not because I thought Caleb Williams would throw three interceptions, which is what ended up happening. Offense was the was the faulty unit there that time, and I think that just goes to show is that, like, if you're in Caleb Williams or anybody else on that offense, you can't have an off day because the defense won't bail you out. I also have to question how USC is even built as a team at this point because the offensive line, more specifically, was the major issue all night. Now, granted, I'm super high on Notre Dame and I'm super high on their defense. I hold true to that statement. And so part of it is that they just ran into one of the best defenses that they're gonna see all year. It's, it's so hard to see USC even standing with one loss. And just kind of by process of elimination, Oregon and Washington are the two left standing. I think those two will play each other again in the conference title game, but hey, we're only midway through October. Lots to go between then and now. Now let's get to our weekly top 10 list. Number 10, North Carolina. North Carolina is starting to establish themselves, especially because their defense is greatly improved from last year as a potential contender in the ACC. You know that I haven't been as high on Florida State, more on them in a minute, but th they could legitimately challenge Florida State for the title this year. Number nine, Oregon. I, I hate moving them this low, but I still think Texas has a much better win than them. Like I said, everything's still in front for Oregon. They can take care of business between then and now. They'll get another shot at Washington. They can still get back into it. They have one of the better defensive fronts in the country, and I expect between them and Bonex, 
they'll be fine. Number eight, Texas. I, I'm having Texas over Oregon because they have far and away the better win between the two. Everything I said about Oregon still applies to Texas. Everything's still in front of them. They should be able to start to bounce back from that Oklahoma loss. Number seven, Florida State. I'll give Florida State credit for this. They have started to get more and more consistent, especially on the offensive side of the ball as key guys like Jordan Travis was dealing with injuries for a little bit. Florida State's looking a lot better than they did in September, and I expect that trend to continue. Number six, Penn State. Currently, Penn State has the top ranked defense in all of FBI in a top 15 rushing attack. Drew Aller has been playing pretty well. Penn State's just kind of a hard team to read right now just because they haven't played anybody of note. And no, I'm not going to count Iowa in that statement. And, but we'll know, we'll know more by 3 p.m. this Saturday. Number five. It almost feels criminal to have Washington only move up to five. I can't really justify dropping teams ahead of them. And now, I try not to fall into the poll inertia idea too quickly. If Washington can win out, they should be one of the top four teams. And frankly, they should be one of the top two teams seated. They're, they're just playing that good right now. And to be honest, the more I think about it, the more I think it's crazy that I have them listed this far. This low, but uh, there's a log jam of good teams ahead of them, so it's... Hmm. Number four, Oklahoma. They were on the bye week coming off of that dramatic win over Texas. They look to keep it rolling this week. The rest of the Big 12, barring like a major upset, shouldn't pose too much of a challenge to either Oklahoma or Texas, and so I fully expect to see both playing each other again this December. Number three, Ohio State. For the second time in a month, they will be playing a top 10 team, this time at home. The big concern for them is that they are dealing with a rash of injuries for the second year in a row at the running back position. More on that later, believe me. Well, we'll see what that offensive line is truly made of when they go against the best defense in the country. Number two, Michigan. Michigan's still chugging along. I don't have anything to say. They're still doing their thing. I would like to see Michigan do it against a better team, but you can only do it against the teams in front of you, so power to them. Number one, Georgia. I, I'm, I This is the one that I'm shakiest on because I've been kind of shaky on Georgia all year. Georgia just lost Brock Bowers to an injury. It's a high ankle sprain, apparently. They're, they're discussing options with, like, tightrope surgery and things like that. Honestly, kind of whether or not Georgia stays in this position is kind of dependent on Brock Bowers' health. I, like, they're just not the same team offensively if he's not on the field. Carson Beck has looked good. It's, it's really, really hard to replace a guy like that. There, there's whispers that he might even miss the rest of the regular season, but it's, it's still kind of up in the air at this point. And so there you have it. That's my top 10 list this week. Let's get to the lightning round. Okay, so we have three other ranked matchups between Penn State and Ohio State to get through, and I'm going to talk about them first. First one, Duke at Florida State. I got to be honest, this is kind of an underwhelming matchup for me, and and it's it's really no fault on the part of Duke. I've actually been pretty high on Duke all year. The issue is that at the end of the Notre Dame game, Riley Leonard had kind of a bad twist of his ankle, and it turned out to be a high ankle sprain, and so it's something that's held him out since that game. Mike Elko, their head coach, is a little bit mum on whether or not he's going to play. Reportedly, he's day-to-day, -day, but even if he does play in a somewhat limited capacity, like, like he's on a brace or, or he's like not 100% health-wise, I don't think that's going to be enough, especially in Tallahassee, to overcome Florida State. Duke has a really good defense, and the defense to keep this game competitive for a little bit, but if Riley Leonard doesn't play, or if he plays in a limited capacity, especially because his calling card is to be a running quarterback, and with how consistent and healthy Florida State is starting to look, unfortunately for Duke, I like Florida State to win and cover the 14 and a half point spread. So Florida State by 15 or more. Number two, Tennessee at Alabama. Okay, so Alabama fell out of my top 10 this week because they blew, they nearly blew, I think it was like an 18 point lead to Arkansas at home, and th they've just had a couple of really shaky games in a row where, where it's clear that they're the better of the team and it's clear that we're not really in danger of losing this game they just don't quite look like they should and part of the reason is that Jalen Moreau is one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the country which is not something I ever thought I'd see out of an Alabama team but he's been sacked 31 times on the on the flip side Tennessee actually has a really good defensive line and so I do expect Tennessee's defense to keep this game close for a while now this game kind of goes goes on to how Joe Milton's playing. Tennessee has looked better in the last couple weeks, but Joe Milton is still super inconsistent as a quarterback, and to be honest, he just doesn't have the same magic that Hendon Hooker did a year later. But we've seen Joe Milton's ceiling with the Orange Bowl, but we've also seen a floor with it. This game is gonna depend on whether or not he can show up. My worry with Tennessee is this game's in Tuscaloosa. This game was in Knoxville. 
I would go Tennessee because it's not, I like Alabama to win, but I like Tennessee to cover the nine point spread. Number three, Utah at USC. USC is currently favored by minus seven as of the time of this recording. I'm doing this recording on Wednesday night of this week. A little bit more information about Utah has come out that uh, not only did Cam Rising tear his ACL, he was held out for the first half of the season and a lot of people didn't know why or in Utah was very quiet about the whole thing. It turns out he did a lot more damage to his knee than just tearing his ACL. There was a meniscus issue. There was an LCL issue. And I think an MCL as well. Point being, it was multiple ligaments, multiple cartilage issues. They're even talking about potentially just medically redshirting him from the air and just throwing in the towel on him. All of this is to say that despite USC's embarrassing loss last week, I, especially because they're at home, I and this is probably more than a little bit of a revenge game, given what Utah did to them last year. I kind of like USC to not only win, but to cover as well. Like the other two games I said, I think the defense can keep it close for a long time. Without Cam Rising, you have no offensive spark. You're not keeping up with Caleb Williams. He's not, he's not going to have two games in a row where he throws that many interceptions. It's just not happening. USC wins, they cover. And then fourth, oh man. Iowa. Iowa's a fascinating team this year because their offense is even worse this year than it was last year. And I thought with the addition of Cade McNamara, they'd have more of a sense semblance of like competency. Now, to be fair to Iowa, some of that is injury influence, but like they're ranked below UMass offensively. So that said, their defense can and will and continue to win them games and this game should be no different. Minnesota is hovering around 500 right now. The, the issue with Minnesota is that they're still inconsistent offensively and still just have had a lot of growing pains at quarterback. This isn't the type of game for Minnesota to overcome those kinds of issues, but Iowa wins, they cover. And that brings us to our headliner game of the week, Penn State goes on the road to Columbus, Ohio to face Ohio State. And so this is like the third straight week where there's a top undefeated top 10 ranked matchup. Penn State has not beaten Ohio State since 2016 and that and they've lost something like 10 out of the last 11 matchups or in that neighborhood. For all the noise, and a lot of people are picking Penn State this week. A lot of people like their offense, they, they like their running game, they like their defense. And a lot of people like how these two schools match up. So let's, let's look at it. So I think one of the more relevant stats as far as Penn State is concerned is that they are averaging 268 yards, rushing yards per game, which is nearly 80 more than what Ohio State manages. Penn State has a pretty good running back tandem. They're all sophomores. Um, them, Drew Aller, like a lot of these guys, Penn State's a very young team. So a lot of the big names we're going to see in this game and the big names we've been hearing all year, we're going to hear about them again next year. Meanwhile, Ryan Day has never lost to Penn State. Like I said in my top 10 list, Penn State State has the top rated defense in the FBS. If you look at in terms of yards per play, they're giving up less than four yards per play. If you look at in terms of total yards and points, everything, which, which is really, really impressive. However, these defensive numbers are really why a lot of people like Penn State in this matchup. For the record, as of the time of this recording, the spread is four and a half in favor of Ohio State, but it, but it's like a really low under, about 45 and a half. What that tells me is that it's, it kind of expected that this is going to be a really defensive game. It wouldn't shock me, to be honest, if this game kind of, in a lot of ways, mirrored Ohio State's previous game against Notre Dame earlier this year, where it's just kind of, you're playing almost field position and whoever has the ball last wins. It, like, it, it's kind of expected to go that way. The big matchup a lot of people want to see is Ohio State's rushing attack versus Penn State's lights-out defense. And to make things worse for Ohio State, Ohio State has something like the 92nd-ranked rushing attack through the first six games this year. Like, those two numbers do not bode well for Ohio State. I've said the offensive lines for issues for Ohio State need to get better, and this game in Michigan later down the line are really the big benchmarks to see if they can really step it up. At some point, issues like that do make your luck start to run out, so is this the time? I don't wanna be all doom and gloom for Ohio State just yet because I have questions about Penn State both offensively and defensively. First thing, Penn State actually averages like a yard less per play than Ohio State does on offense. Part of that is that despite the fact that Drew Aller has actually been really good at quarterback and they have this really good running attack, they don't hit very many big explosive plays, which plays into the strengths of Ohio State's defense. Ohio State is known for offensively, they've been a lot of, they've been a lot more sound, especially in the secondary. They don't get as many sacks as 
I think Ohio State fans are typically used to seeing. While Penn State has the top overall rated defense in terms of all the combined metrics, Ohio State has the seventh ranked defense. And so while one is at an elite tier, it's the other isn't that far behind. The big question I have for Penn State's defense is, I mean, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Penn State's last five games on on the uh, screen here. Listen to the, the opponents they've played this year. The last five games have been against Mass UMass, which was a 63 to nothing win. Northwestern, which was a 41 to 13 win. Iowa, wh whom Penn State shut out at home. Illinois, who hung around before Penn State pulled ahead 30 to 13. And then University of Delaware, an FCS school. You have UMass, UDell, Northwestern, and Iowa are the offenses they're playing. They have the second rated strength of schedule remaining, meaning they have played the second hardest schedule from here on out because they have to play both Ohio State and Michigan. But up to this point, they have the 112th ranked strength of schedule. Granted, their defense and offense for the most part have done what you should do against a schedule like that. I just think that their offense, their defensive stats are being incredibly inflated by playing UMass and UDO. And like, for God's sake, Iowa has the last ranked offense in all of FBS, or like they're 132nd out of 133. You can't tell me that that is a good defensive, it, it, sure, you shut them out. Sure, they didn't get past the 50, or, or like they had like two plays past the 50 in that game. Iowa barely gets past the 50 against anyone. That's not a unique thing to do. And to make things worse, the two times they played on the road were in Illinois and in Northwestern, and both times, both of those teams were hanging around for a while. Part of why they pulled ahead of Northwestern is Northwestern kept going for it on fourth down in their own territory, so they kept turning it over on downs, and this happened two or three drives in a row. Penn State would just take over on like the Northwestern 30. Of course they're gonna score. And, and, and this isn't to say Penn State's defense is bad. It's not. It's just, I don't think it's this overwhelming dominating thing and Ohio State's only going to score 10 points against. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Now, Ohio State's offensive line issues, as I've said, are very, very real and should not be ignored and could very well cost them the game against this team. And to make matters worse, their entire running back room is injured for the second year in a row. If you didn't pay attention to Ohio State last year, they lost, I think, their top four running backs to injury at one point or another, and it got so bad that they were using a tight end at running back when they were playing Georgia. And something similar is happening. Trevion Henderson has been in and out of the lineup with injury issues. Mayan Williams has been out for a few weeks. Chip Trainum was the primary bell cow against Purdue. He went down. And so their top three running backs are all dealing with injuries in some form or other. And to make the situation worse, all American receiver Mecca Ubuka, he hasn't played in two weeks for this team. He's been dealing with injuries. Coach Ryan Day has been very, very, very quiet about the injury status of all these guys. Another notable injury for Ohio State is Denzel Burke, one of their starting corners. If Ohio State loses this game, it's because their offensive line issues combined with injuries to some of the most talented running backs in college kill any and all sort of offensive momentum. That is one direction this game could go. Another direction this game could go. This is the first time Drew Aller has played like a true row game against the truly good team. He's been good, but he hasn't hit the big explosive plays. So can he do that? Like I said, Penn State's a very young team. So sometimes, sometimes it takes going and being in this environment to bring it out of you. Or sometimes you need to learn through adversity. And part of why I trust Ohio State like a little bit more here, they just did last month what Penn State is trying to do right now. Go on the road against a top 10 team, incredibly hostile environment against a team that matches up pretty well with you typically, and then win. And, and then not only that, they put first year starter Kyle McCord in a position to where he had to be the reason why they won. Can Penn State do that? Can Drew Aller do that? It remains to be seen. Doesn't mean I don't think it can't happen, it just means that it's an uphill climb. And so Penn State usually does match up really, really well with Ohio State. Even though Ohio State's won six or seven straight in this series, a lot of them involve dramatic comebacks or, or their one score games going into the fourth quarter before an unlucky bounce or a series of turnovers. Like last year, it was a series of turnovers. Just because of how closely these two teams always play each other, I have a hard time seeing it go any other way. But I think because they're at home and because I think Ohio State is the more battle-tested team, I'm going to give the slight edge here to Ohio State to win, but Penn State to cover. And that's all I have for you guys this week. Thank you for sticking around. And remember, stick around on Sundays for updates on the Washington Commanders with a John Kime report. You can find us at Empire Media, that's Empire with an A, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for sticking around, and we'll see you next week.